Hello there. Good evening and thanks for joining me in this fresh edition of the program, The Insight on Equinox Television. We are inside Jakiri in the northwest region of Cameroon, Bui Division. Tonight I will be receiving two guests. The first one will be the MP for the Jakiri Special Constituency, Honorable Wilbur Joseph of the Social Democratic Front Party. With him, we shall be looking at the statistics gotten from the ground so far after sending a 15 man delegation to the two English speaking regions of Cameroon. Honorable Weber Joseph will be telling us how many persons died equally in this edition of the program. Another guest tonight is Senior Barrister Fru John Saw with him. We shall be looking at 35 years in power of the new Uzi government since President Pobia ascended power in 1982. These and more will be yours. I'll be right back. Honorable Wilbur Joseph will be my first guest tonight. You're welcome back to join me. This is the insight you're watching on Equinox Television. Honorable Wilbur Joseph, after sending a 15-man delegation to the two English-speaking regions of the country, he tells us that 122 people died and about uh, some 16,000 internally displaced within the country. Stay tuned. There is a lot that's been happening to our country. And you are aware that uh, we have a government that treats everybody who comes out with the truth like, uh, like a criminal. Because in their thinking, if you do not think like them, then you are the wrong person. So I want to welcome you here and to say the reason for which we, have, we are having this brief is because I thought it was necessary for us to sit down and uh, review the events of the past few weeks. The 22nd of September, the 1st uh, of October, which had brought untold violence, government violence on our people. Uh, you were asking about my delay. Or if you have come to know my style, I do not talk from the top of my head. The first thing is, I was shocked as what this government would still think it would do with this kind of 15th century political tactics of shooting down anybody who dis disagrees with it. So I was shocked. And in that shock and in my observation what they had done, my heart was broken. Um, I didn't want to invite anybody and sit here and start weeping like a schoolboy. So I needed to give myself time. Meanwhile, I also had teams on the ground with whom I was working to assess the actual situation so that when we sit down to talk, we are talking facts, not hearsay and not presumptions. So that's why it took me this long because um, um, I'm a very emotional person. That's why most of the times when issues come up at the National Assembly and I'm hot about it, you find me screaming because you know, it goes straight to my heart. So the, the amount of violence, what this government has done to our people is heartbreaking. And I only came to the conclusion, which I had known before anywhere, that any government, any organization, public or private, that can do this, to people they claim are theirs would only be people who are doing it out of one human emotion, which is hate. And it is dangerous when a government proves that it hates a segment of its population, talk less of one that had a state of its own and brought it into a union with those who are today killing them. It is shocking. So I needed to take my time to come over this, to gather my facts, and then uh, get on to this kind of discussion. Because it took me uh, to 10 different towns and sites to observe for myself. Whereas the Commission members we sent out were working in all the 13 divisions uh, in order to bring us a comprehensive assessment of what damage you know, government violence has done to our people. And the Commission's work has been 
almost reconfirmed by other organizations, human rights organizations, uh, our commission's work has come up with 122 people dead in connection with the violence that began on the 1st of October and which to us is still ongoing because a lot of people are still being chased around the place and we don't know who may die again in the process. Um, I can confirm to you that our findings came up with 150 people missing. Missing means their family cannot account for them. They can't trace them. They've never spoken to anybody. They have not contacted anybody, family or friend, from the 1st of October. There are 150 of them. Then our findings also came up with the statistic that 1,894 persons were injured either by direct gunshots, torture, or other forms of violence that the soldiers meted out on the people. 1,894 of them. And we now have at least 16,000 people internally displaced in the northwest and the southwest. One of the things that actually happened that many people uh, did not understand or did not take maybe great notice of was that uh, our people were told or ordered by the governors of the southwest and the northwest for three days that there would be no movement. People should stay at home. And the people stayed at home. Then the soldiers moved into these same homes and were shooting, raping, looting. Any, anybody they lay hands on. And we now are in a situation where we have people lying home as patients whose bones were just broken. People just moving out of their houses to theta goats or to carry water, just broken up and are lying in hospitals. And there was a chase for every able bodied adult. And some of these people now had to move to other parts of the country, move to other parts of, you know, uh, wherever they could feel safe. And uh, in the process of taking down our statistics, we then discovered that more than 16,000 people are not home. They have been displaced. They are moving, you know, up and down, trying to find where there is safety. Because now that I speak to you, there still are soldiers, gendarmes, police people going around, hunting down people. There are long and interminable lists I hear are being handed out by people who say they are supporting the regime and supporting the party in power handing out lists in villages and in towns of people they now believe that if the government eliminated or kept in jail, then the survival of the regime would be guaranteed. So there are still all of these things going on. And that is what has caused the displacement of this number of people. Then coming down to the refugees, uh, I think it's quoted all over. Uh, the UNHCR had already come out with a figure. The governor of the Cross River State in Nigeria actually held an official meeting a few days back just to look for ways and means of how they would contain this number of people who had suddenly you know, landed on their doorsteps. And uh, to tell you the truth, uh, I haven't been there yet, but part of our commission members visited and were able to confirm that you had these crowds of people crowded in areas without security, without safety, no water, no portable water, you know, with young children, some of them having children on the way as they were running across.
As far as statistics are concerned, you've gotten there from the SDF Member of Parliament for the Jakiri Special Constituency, Honorable Wiba Joseph. Now, he equally comes back to the delegation that was uh, recently sent to the two English-speaking regions of the country to preach peace. According to Honorable Wiba Joseph, the head of state probably has never spoken specifically on the Anglophone crisis. Take a listen. Most of the time, I prefer to talk about what we are able to do, what I can push on, what the people can do rather than speculating on what the people who are killing us are doing. So you are now talking about the head of state. Who told you the head of state sent anybody? We have had a crisis in a nation in which 1.2 million children are out of school for one year and the head of state has never, ever said anything. And somebody comes acting his drama in your space and you believe that the head of state sent him. I don't believe it. So I think it is part of the drama to keep us in slavery. I think it is part of their action to keep blindfolding the English-speaking peoples of Cameroon because in my understanding of what nations are and what a head of state should be and should do, if children were out of school for one week the head of state should have been coming himself to find out what is wrong. That is why I keep saying these people in governance do not believe in our humanity. By humanity, by our humanity, I refer to the humanity of the English-speaking people of Cameroon. I found the head of state when our children were out of school for eight months stepping out to talk about how he was ready to put up the infrastructure for the nation's COP to take place. And the head of state has to send somebody to talk about our children out of school for a year and our people killed in their hundreds. I'm embarrassed. Nobody should talk to me about what the head of state has sent somebody to do. If the head of state can find it easy to talk about football, and cannot talk about our children out of school and the killings that have been going on in the Northwest and the Southwest for over a year, then it means the head of state himself and his government do not consider our people part of their nation. Because if they did, we would have been sitting here and discussing that the head of state has been here five, six, seven times to try to solve the problem, which is still unsolved. So don't impress me with anybody who goes acting drama. It's a charade. It's a complete charade. And it's an insult on the blood of our people that has been let. It is an insult on their blood. So I would not want to be wasting my energy on things like that. It is when you recognize people as human that you can recognize that they are equal to you and the same laws that bind them should bind you. The same laws that send them to jail should send you to jail. If laws are made for them and not for us, then it means that they do not completely recognize our humanity. And if there's anything we have to begin talking about in trying to resolve the issues, the now profound difficulties and issues we have in this country, we will have to step back in there and push this governing class, push them to recognize that we are human just like they are. It surprises me a lot, ladies and gentlemen, to discover that a government minister or a director or a commander of a brigade or of a battalion or a duo suddenly feels that he has the power to order for the killing of citizens. And then when you or me complain about somebody he has killed, he wants to kill you in addition. It's amazing to believe that in the 21st century people still have their heads buried in the sand, to believe like this government does, that you can do all of these things and then just walk away from it because you explain them. Because you gave such a very good explanation for killing people. It doesn't work. Call us terrorists, call us separatists, call us anything. It doesn't change the fact that we are human. If you want any issues resolved with us, you will have to recognize that we are human at equal footing with you. 
sit down with us and put those issues on the table and start resolving them. Without which, I can guarantee you, they are helping break down a country and look. It is not any of their preoccupation. If it will, as I told you from the onset, the president of this republic should have been in Boya in Bermuda just to say, come in and tell me what is wrong so that we fix it up for the sake of our children. It is not their preoccupation. Their preoccupation is returning the country to normalcy so that they can keep us in slavery. Remember, I said this from the National Assembly Rostro. This government should remember that the people of this territory are not their slaves. It is suddenly that they are discovering that even those people they consider slaves are beginning to take action that can free them. That is their worry. Their concern is not us. Their concern is how they can return the country to normalcy and keep us where we are. So don't tell me anything about being their preoccupation, in quotes. It is not. Because if it were, they would not be killing people in order to make them believe that they can stop what they are doing. In fact, what they have done is harden the hearts of our people, is make them more determined, it should make our people believe that since the government and its own supporters do not believe that we are humans like them, that we deserve the things they have, that we deserve the freedom that we need, then we'd never be able to go anywhere. The slave master has a tactic. Don't accept freedom because it will be worse than the slavery you are suffering under me. That's why you are asking that question. If you believe in freedom, you cannot be talking about why shops are shop, why children are not in school, if the people ruling the country recognize us and our children as any humans of value, they will not let a lot of things, we grumble about a lot of things, we complain about a lot of things for over 56 years, that they will degenerate to this before they start showing concern. I want to be clear about this. When people need to free their hand from oppression, there are sacrifices they make. Do you know this? Maybe you don't. If you do not know this, freedom, as we say, has never been gotten for free. If the sacrifices we can make are to hold down the schools, our children from going to those schools, are to shut down our shops because the shops belong to us and the government is only crying that the shops are locked because they are waiting for us to sell and pay them taxes. The taxes for which we never see what they do with the money. If all of these things, all of, you know, in the process of looking for freedom, there are sacrifices you make. I have been telling those who care to listen. If we can ask for the recognition of our humanity, if we can ask for an equal footing with a government that has turned us into its slaves, if we can demand it not through any other means, but civil disobedience, then we are being very civil. In other countries, people pick up arms and fight their governments. We are too civilized to do any such thing. We know that there are measures and measures in civil action that can bring pressure to bear even on the most oppressive government so that it can free its people who are under this kind of oppression <coughs> that our people have been suffering for 56 years. 56 years is not 56 days. If we are waiting for 56 years, and only are shutting down schools, and only are closing down our own shops, which do not belong to the government. I thought the government would be happier. I don't see any reason why it bothers them. Because if it were bothering them to the core, what they should have been doing was, what do the people of this territory want that we have not offered them? How can we make it work? It won't be shooting them down, 
killing their children. Uh, one of the experiences I met talking to a lot of those children is something I should let you know here. That I met 14, take down this number, 14 young children, two are girls, the other 12 are boys, where their bones were broken with clubs or just heavy pieces of blood, just broken by soldiers. Soldiers whose duty is to protect those children. This is unheard of in modern history. I have read a lot about history and the history of freedom. I am shocked that in the 21st century, we can still find a government like the Cameroonian government that would do this to its people just to create space for itself. If a government has to do this, my conclusion there is simple. The English-speaking peoples, call them Northwest and Southwest, call them West Cameroonians, call them Southern Cameroonians. It is a reference to the same people. Our people need to come together very, very quickly and put a package, a strong and powerful package, to take towards this government, to tell them where we stand in relation to our mistreatment and the negation of our humanity. We need to do that, and that is a matter of urgency. Now, Honorable Weber Joseph equally talks about the treatment of Anglophones in Cameroon. He told pressmen that Anglophones in Cameroon are considered as second-hand citizens, that citizens who are not in the first place when it comes to uh, the appointment, when it comes to uh, some special considerations. Honorable Weber Joseph equally talks about the resignation of some MPs as far as the SDF party is concerned. He says it is good to uh, withdraw and that it is not good to resign from parliament because when you resign the power that the people gave you you are going to lose it take a listen to honorable weber i would like to make a clarity here with you to say that mps should not for any reason for any reason from the northwest and the southwest resign their responsibilities Instead, they should withdraw from the assembly that is killing their people in order to prove to both the people and the government that what they are doing is not sustainable and that they cannot swallow it. So there should be a withdrawal from the House of Assembly. I am saying this with comfort and with confidence because... I raise the issues there myself. And when the Speaker of the Assembly tells me that issues to do with us cannot be discussed in a certain place, or that they have not come there for that kind of discussion, then it implies that we, the English-speaking peoples of Cameroon, have no place in that house. That is the exact meaning. So nobody is even supposed to be advising the, the other to withdraw or to resign. If at all, all of us went there to represent our people. If people went there for other reasons, then they have reasons to be reconsidering. But if a government would do what this government has done to the people who voted you into the National Assembly, and you do not react forcefully, then the meaning is that those people are not represented in you. So we should be able to draw that dist distinction. If it is people's representation, then we should sit up to our responsibilities as parliamentarians because the actual job of an MP is to make laws, is to stand up for their people. In Cameroon, you cannot make the laws. Then when you only want to say it on behalf of your people, the guns come out and are looking for you, it means that this is not a nation, this is not a kind of state we understand. We from the Anglo-Saxon culture, we don't know anything like this. If an MP resigns 
then he will need another vote to talk on behalf of the people who voted him. But if an MP withdraws, he takes away the power given by his people away from his people's killers back to the people and then he and the people or they and the people can now work on how to use that power to prove to that government that it is not doing what the people sent you or they there to do we have to have this clarity all right uh, then you were talking about the meeting of the party uh, having met and are talking about yeah which is a few days back I, I am glad to tell you that I'm hearing it from you because uh, I am sure that my stand which my party is approved they must have excluded me from everything I'm hearing about the meeting from you I haven't heard about it so if they were holding a meeting to discuss that uh, I would just want to mention that uh, you know they would have been very very late to start talking about things like this because a party like the SDF for which people lost their lives for which people like me sacrificed everything they had including your famous civil service jobs in Cameroon to make sure that we hold the party and you know change to, to be brought to Cameroon that we hold it together and uh, if I stand up the way I did in the National Assembly and my party from its chairman to the rest of the executive shy away from their responsibilities of turning up and talking on behalf of the people I can only feel sorry I can only feel sorry because the people are moving in a totally different direction from where the SDF party is and if the party feels that it represents or talks on behalf of those people, then it should start doing more than just paying lip service to it. And I believe that the party could have shown its belief in freedom and in the negation of the humanity of the English-speaking peoples of Cameroon by backing publicly and on the parliamentary floor the issues I had raised. Uh, if they fail to do that, then I'm absolutely, you know, sorry about that. And I think then that the meaning would be that the SDF revolution is dwindling out. Because it was the revolution we started, and I've worked for it all. This is the 27th year of my engagement, without relent, with all my energy, losing everything I could ever have to protect, putting my own life in danger, the way I'm doing now. And uh, if the party reaches a level where it starts feeling that, oh, well, you know, we could do it half on half and still get what the people want, then they are making a huge, huge mistake. So without mincing words, uh, my party disappointed me. Uh, if by the time we finish this interview, I am short, can I be in your own day? The answer is no. Why don't we leave future responsibilities to the future and then see how they evolve? Because uh, why I'm saying this is simple, uh, I'm not a free man. I want you to know that I'm not a free man because people are sniffing around, they are you know, bogging down my children, my family, everybody. They want to know every movement I make. Security is here and there. And uh, the day that one of them chooses to take you out, you can never guarantee. So what I can say is, from me, as an individual, I can only talk for myself. The carnage we have seen and experienced the things that have happened to our people done by the same government I stand and cry out to and it cannot listen to the voice of those same people if they can come and do this to these people it will need me asking the people whether I deserve to sit there on their, in their name ever again it would deserve me asking them that question 
getting their confirmation before I can do it because I don't know what else I could do there except they told me because my responsibilities as an MP have been taken to the ultimate end. You go to parliament to represent your people, to talk on their behalf, to make laws that can advance their lives, to oppose issues and things or laws that can be detrimental to their own survival. And I have tried all of this in three years, found myself being chased with guns into exile, and I choose of my own accord to return. That return was with one full meaning. I was coming back home to die on behalf of the people I believe in. And if I'm still alive some four months after, I can only say thank God that before they look the guns that can take me out, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing, standing up against this violent government that our people are not their slaves. That is to say go back to the parliament and continue the job. I already told you just uh, a minute before, okay. yes, I already told you that just a minute before, that uh, <coughs> it will now need, because when you have a hundred plus people killed in your part of the country because the people were holding a demonstration to demand a certain thing, why should the issue of a state that was brought into this union become taboo? for which hundreds of our people have to die. It's unheard of. It's unacceptable. From Jakiri, you've just heard there, the, the SDF Special uh, MP for the Jakiri Special Constituency, Honorable Weber Joseph. Let's now move into another section. We're talking about the 35 years in power of President Paul Biam. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest tonight, the second one tonight, is Senior Barrister Fru John So. He will be looking at the challenges, the successes, and the failures of the New Deal government. Join my guests. He first of all will begin with some of the failures, especially he talks about the 1984 attempted coup, which he says was the turning point in some of the obstacles that Cameroonians encountered since the ascension to power of President Paul Bia. I will say that uh, the New Deal government has been successful in about 20 percent and has failed in about 80 percent because why do I say that because when President Bia took over the realm of power in 1982 I was still abroad I was still in, the, in Houston Texas and everybody was excited and that is one the most important reason that brought me back home I could have been practicing law in the US and and stayed in the U.S. like others, but because there was a, a, a change in Cameroon, I decided as a young man to come back home. And from 82 to 84, everything went quite nicely. The turning point was 1984, after the coup. That was the turning point of this regime. I mean that the coup totally changed President Pobia from a liberal president that he presented himself before to a dictator. Why do I say that? Because he was now he because whether he felt unsecured, he surrounded himself he surrounded himself with people who were of his tribe and who thought that he needed to be protected, they surrounded him and instead of giving him the proper advice to continue the way he had, he had started, they ring into him that his power was probably, probably threatened and from there on things started falling apart. The first thing that struck me was when he changed the name of the country in 1984 from United Republic of Cameroon to La Republic of Cameroon. Being a legal scholar, 
I saw that as a threat to we, the English-speaking people, because we were here because we joined our brothers, and, and there was an agenda. And if the name was changed back to the name that we came to independence, that was the first, his first political blunder. I don't know whether he knows that. I don't know whether he knows that Anglophones did not take that lightly. And the, the events of that year flew in the opposite direction. First, Dr. John Gu Poncha resigned from the CPDM. Second, Honorable S.T. Muna resigned from the CPDM, even though he had just retired, and everything started falling apart. I am still talking politically now, yes. before we come to the level of development. So, from there on, it was total dictatorship until the 1990s when a bookseller in Bermuda decided to take the bull by the horn. Well, he was not the only one. If you know the history of the SDF, there were 10 people who sat and brought together this SDF. But he, the John Frundi was one of the, was the boldest because he came much later. He was not even a founding father. He came much later, brought in by his cousin, Professor Siga Sanga. And the two of them launched the SDF in Bermuda. They forced the door open for multipartism. In my opinion, talking like a legal scholar, it was not the president who brought about uh, 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 multipartism. You remember, the cassettes are still there. When they, the CPTM organized a match in, Bo in Boya, the, f the, the, the famous Demabola, and, the, and uh, you remember Etoy singing Demabola, the, the and also in Yaoundé, uh, Emma Bazi was talking about part of democracy. So they did not, they didn't see anything wrong with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the one-party system. And Mr. John Frundi in Bamenda did what he had to do. And that day, we lost six English-speaking people in Bamenda. You know, you can see, uh, as the time goes on, I will tell you how we, we keep losing people. We keep sacrificing for this country. We, when I say we, I mean we, the English-speaking people. We, the people of the, the West Cameroon. We have paid the heaviest price in this country. That same year, we lost six people in Bamenda. And for some reason, maybe he was advised, so he sent to Parliament the famous 1990, 1990, 1990 laws that brought about the return to multi-party politics. Multi politics and the liberty, what, you, the affirmative, uh, what they call now the liberty laws. I don't know why they call them liberty laws because most of them were, were to say the least, not as, as, as liberal as they call it today. From there on, even though the multi-party thing was accepted, the first presidential election after that was in 92, where John Frundi won, and his, he, uh, Mr. Bia and his group forcefully seized power from him and declared themselves winners. Every Cameroonian, every Cameroonian... I may not prove it, but those who were in that commission, I will take, I will take as a witness the present presidential candidate, Akeremona. I will take for witness Mr. Uh, Mr. Bandam, uh, Martin Bandam, who is a parliamentarian today. He was in that commission. So. It's not a question of proving it were in politics. He, they, they, he, Frundi won that election. And if I, if, I, if I remember very well, I was in the counting commission in Bonanjo, representing the SDF. And uh, Dwala was catastrophic for him, for, for the CPDM, because SDF had the highest score in Dwala in the, in the Buri, second by UNDP, and 
CPDM came third, distant third. So of our own results in the country, Prundi won that election. He seized power, put Prundi under house arrest, militarized again the Bamenda town, especially Prundi's residence. With all those, and what struck me was the arrival of Desmond Tutu for the first time, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa for the first time in Bamenda. I was in Bamenda and I saw him arrive. And uh, there on, SDF gave up after meeting with, uh, with Desmond Tutu. We have remained in a, in a single party system, in a, in a single party system by oppression up to today. Why do I say that? The other political parties are excluded from the media except what the law requires, like the weekly thing that you see on television. They are excluded from the media. If you turn to t television today, you will see only CPDM people. You are talking about national media. National media. That is the media, that's the people's media, because the people pay for it. The national media, the CRTV, you turn on it, you only see, you only see the CPDM. And uh, everywhere now is only CPDM. Everything that concerns this government is CPDM. Even the Anglophone crisis is CPDM. Everything is CPDM up to now that we're talking. So it is actually, we're actually still in the one-party system, but with a certain coloration gives the impression of a multi-party country. I read the English version of his book, Why Stay in America? It was impressive, but you could, you could read between the lines that it, 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 it was a book written by somebody who wants to stay in power and in control. But the ideas that he expounded on the book were lovely. Moralization and so on and so forth. But if you look at the, uh, the, the, the corruption index of this country, it has been one of the worst in the world. So nothing really changed. The turning point was that coup in 1984. When he started, he was fair and good, very, 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 very liberal and very and open up. But in 1984, things changed. And for several years, they have confiscated power and they have remained in power up to this time that we're talking, 35 years after. Yes, except that he, uh, he has used the present fight against corruption to set a political scores. I'm not saying that those who are in jail have not embezzled, but lots and lots of them who are still out here, ministers and so the director generals and so on, who, have, who are embezzlers and they are still moving around because they are loyal. But if you had embezzled and you were a little bit, you wanted to challenge the status quo, you will go in. So he used the corruption thing to set his course. And you see, I don't know whether I can blame it on him alone. But the corruption exists in Cameroon? Yes, it does exist. Those people in jail, I'm not, I'm, I think that they also embezzled. I am not holding brief for them. But I'm saying that they, almost the whole government would have been in jail. But only half of the government is in jail. So, the moralization I was thrown to the docks since after the 84 coup. Even though he tried to recover by arresting certain people after that, but it only came, you remember when we started crying out, he said, who's only proof? Who's only proof? And where did the proof now came that he was able to arrest some of his people and put in jail? I'm not saying that those in jail were not guilty. Yes, they are. But there are a lot of them out here who are also guilty, who are still moving around and, and ruling and not unpetopped.
There have equally been some successes so far. According to my guest, Senior Barrister Fru Johnson, the new D government could be given a pat on the back for at least sustaining the energy sector in the country. He talks about the massive construction of dams, the Lompanga, the Memvele. He equally talks about the construction of the second bridge over the River Wuri. Our barrister now assesses the BIA's regime in terms of development, in terms of infrastructure, and even the economy. Yes, I, I, was, I, I was going to come to that. that I will not take the, the, the issue of development. Uh, if you look at what he has done to solve the energy crisis in this country, it's laudable. Like the dams that are being constructed, the Memphela, the, 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 the all the dams that are being built around the country, that is laudable. If you also look at the infrastructure, uh, uh, that is hap that is being built in uh, in Douala, like the new bridge on the on the Vuri. That is laudable. He's it, it, doing this too late, 35 years after. Imagine that for 35 years, it is only it is not even finished. The Manfe Kumba Road, <coughs> that's the biggest project that he has ever done on the English side. The Manfe Kumba Road is still going on. It is not yet finished. That is the only thing that we can talk about. Manfe Kumba, Kumba, uh, 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 Kumba Manfe, Manfe Bamenda, and the cock. And it is because of the Green Tree Treaty. I would argue that he is doing that because of the Green Tree Treaty, which he signed with Nigeria. And Nigeria obliged that the most, he must build the Trans-African Highway. They will build from any, from any good through Abakeleke to Ekom, and he will build from Ekok. To, 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 to Kumba and to Bamenda. And it is based on that treaty that he, he now they were, they were now forced to start the Kumba Mafia Road. First, the Bamenda Mafia Road, the Kumba Mafia Road, and the Kok. I will give that to him as a positive uh, development. But I also want to tell you that some of us slept three days from Babaju to Bamenda. And up to now that I'm talking, I don't know what is happening there. He put completely cut off the northwest from the western province by building the road up to Babaju, past through Mbunda and ending in Babaju. And, to, and when you drive from here to Bamenda, passing through there, passing through East Cameroon, you get to Babaju, it takes you another three, four hours to get to Bamenda. And they kept, he kept promising, his minister kept promising, kept promising, kept promising. Now the rains came this year and they are trying to, I don't know what they are doing, whether they are building the road or they are maintaining it, uh, it beats my imagination. But in all, the energy crisis he has tried to solve. We we'll give that to him. The water problem, Dwala doesn't have a water problem now because he solved it. Those are the developments. But if you look at the northwest and the southwest in terms of development. If there is a road that links Douala to, to Victoria, it is because of Sonora. I will argue that it's because of Sonora. Because seeing that road was this Douala Limbe Road was built more than 30 years ago, nothing has happened to it. If you ride from here to Mutengene and then you start going to Limbe, the road is horrible until you are entering Limbe before you see a patch of good road that leads to the stadium. And uh, I, 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 imagine where petroleum in this country comes from, mostly from Jan, Jan Division. Jan Division has no road. There is no road leading to, to Jan right to Bakasi. From, Mondimba, from Kumba to Mondimba, Mondimba, Bakasi, there is no road. You can pass three, four days on that route during the rainy season. Some people decide to take the, 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 the sea. They call it, uh, take a boat. At a certain point, at the Kondo Chiti, they take a boat to get to Mondimba. And that is the, the part of the country that produces the, the backbone of this economy, crude oil. Since he came to power 35 years ago, he has done nothing 
to this enclave in that division. Now, Link it to Kumba. Yes. The review were in the era of IJ2. Uh, you definitely witnessed a structural adjustment program, the five years uh, plan. Uh, when President Bob Yaa came, those, uh, the plan quickly disappeared. Recently, we saw the three years emergency uh, plan. How can you? I, 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 I was a kid growing up when I used to hear uh, about the five year development plan. Ahijo made sure that each five years he, he uh, took development to a particular part of the country, and after that, he takes to another part of the country. And uh, when he left, that was the end of the five year development plan. Uh, I, I, I want to think that what we have today are the infrastructures that Ahijo built. Take the Dwala Yaounde Road. Mr. Bia made that road. I see it now is, is collapsing, cutting into two, putting Cameroonians in danger. You saw what, you saw what resulted to the Ezeka, cry, Ezeka uh, train crash. It was as a result of the road. Uh, a road that he met 35 years after the, the same road is still there. How do you expect a road to stay that long? Uh, he, 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 you would argue that he could have been developing this part of the country. No, he didn't develop any part of the country. Not even to talk of his own division. I, I was amused one day, several years back, about five years back, when I went to Ebolova. And I tell you that when you go to Ebolova, outside of Ebolova town, <laughs> there's no road anywhere else. Those people are, are suffering as much as all of us. They don't expect him to do selective development. I did not, but I'm also saying that I'm making that point to show that he did not do any development for this country for the 35 years that were expected. But I gave him the, 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 energy, the, energy, the energy sector, which he has tried to solve. And I think uh, that's the only positive thing. That, that's why I gave him 20%. Uh, right now, let me come to the perennial problem of the Anglophone crisis. If he was a shrewd politician, he would have started solving this problem instead of aggravating it in 84. Before 84, he was prime minister under Ahijo for long, so he knew about the problems. Before 84, he knew the problems. He aggravated it in 84, and since then, Anglophones have been treated in this country as second-class citizens, and he has done nothing as a head of state of every Cameroonian to address that issue until when it broke out now. So, political speaking, he has failed completely. But economically, because of the economic crisis, I would say that he has tried to solve the energy problem, which is important for any developing country because of industrialization. But outside of that, I would argue that it is time for him to go. Let's try a third hand. Can you imagine that since independence, I was a kid, when Ahijo, I don't know whether I knew anything. I, I came here in, a, in the early 60s. When I mean came here, I mean I became a person in the early 60s and left in the late 60s and left for the United States for studies. I only came back here as a young man. And uh, I was coming back thinking that since Ahijo has gone, uh, this is a new era for us but only to find myself in a quagmire. Some of the human rights challenges in Cameroon. Yes. How, how can you uh, compare the two regimes, the human rights challenges? The human rights challenges Ahijo faced were that orchestrated by the French. The French were using Ahijo because they put him in power. Ahijo uh, treated the, the Basars and the Bamilikes a lot of them were slaughtered in those early, early, early days of independence, for, during the War of Independence, orchestrated by the French. I, I, I'm not saying that I don't blame him, but I will, I will attach him to the French 
and blame the two. Now, if you look at the human rights situation when Mr. Bia came, from 1982 to 1984, if you look at the human rights situation was very good. Nobody was imprisoned. Abe Mukon has come out of prison. Nobody was imprisoned for his ideas. But after the coup of the attempted coup of 1984, the human rights situation started that started going down the drain. People were being arrested left and right. Uh, I know he abolished the, the, the emergency laws that the Hijo had put put in place, but the abolition did not help the human rights situation because uh, up to now that we are talking, a lot of people are in prison for their ideas. Uh, not only anglophones but also francophones. We know about the cases of the of the of the people of the, of that of the political leader in the north, Sadiki, who has been sentenced to 25 years. We know about the cases of uh, uh, the case of Arisu, Mete Arisu. We know about the cases of our anglophone brothers now who are in jail in their numbers. Uh, the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of them are in jail because they question the status quo. So the human rights situation under President Bia, I would argue, was worse than it was under Ahijo. Ahijo shared the blame with the French. The French were the ones who orchestrated the slaughter of the, of the nationalists, particularly from the south, the littoral, and the western province. A lot of Cameroonians lost their lives fighting for independence. Uh, a UPC person will explain that better to, 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 to you. But uh, that was a fight for independence. After that, Ahijo started developing this country. The, the, you remember the Revolution Vet, agriculture, and uh, it made us to believe that there was no oil when they were exploiting oil, when the French were already exploiting oil in the early 70s in Indian in the creeks, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf of Guinea, and he kept turning the population away from that and to get into agriculture, which is why we can eat to our full today. In fact, uh, the short time, the 22 years, I'll call it short time because 22 years as compared to 35, it's a, it's a short time. The short time that he was in power for 22 years, the last 10 years were glorious. The economy was good. He left the balance of payment that was good. But after 1984, it was squandered. Do you think that the way forward for the Anglophone problem, as well as Cameroon in general, what will it be? The way forward for Anglophones. Let me talk about Anglophones before I talk about Cameroon. The way forward for Anglophones is that we follow the advice of the United Nations because the Greek government has failed to negotiate the political situation of this country. Therefore, the inclusive dialogue that the United Nations has proposed should be taken seriously. And secondly, it will help if he's not a candidate in 2018. But if this problem of anglophones is not solved, 2018 is going to be very difficult for this country. I come to the next point which is uh, President Paul Bia does not present his candidature, we should try a third hand. Cameroon should try a third, a third hand. I say Cameroon because I don't know what tomorrow will, will, will look like as, as it concerns with the Anglophones. Because the way things are going, if nothing is gone, I don't know, I cannot make any definitive statement as to whether I will stay a citizen of this country or not. No, I want to tell you for a, for a fact, we are one quarter of this country. And the way this country has been set up, with the present system and the French interference, I don't see an Anglophone as a president in this country. It is their right to, 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 to put their candidature. But I'm not a, a, an agent of doom. But I'm saying that for an Anglophone to become a president in this country is going to, it's like pulling teeth. That is if we stay along here. That was the program produced by Danny Warren Zede. I've been for Hansen Chanji. You've listened to the key actors there.
Honorable Weba Joseph and Senior Barrister Fru John Saw talk about the Anglophone crisis, the intervention of members of parliament, the intervention of President Paul Bia, as well as the ascension to power of the head of state, 35 years on. Thanks for watching this special edition of the program. If you did enjoy the program, take our rendezvous there for next week, Sunday, same time, 6.30 p.m., same channel, Equinox Television. Bye for now.